Wilmot's Warehouse is essentially a game about inventory management. Instead of an abstract cursor on a pause screen, you play as Wilmot, the sole worker in a warehouse of merchandise. Through Wilmot, you'll take the products from the delivery truck, place them in the warehouse, and eventually seek out those products when your coworkers ask for them. If you finish quickly in the service phase, you'll earn performance stars which can be used to purchase upgrades. These can range from a dash ability, a robot dog helper, creating more room in the warehouse, allowing Wilmot to carry more things at once, and so on. Every day, your warehouse stocks four new products, which you can categorize in whichever way makes sense to you. The tutorial shows this off very well, making you sort the winter items together, then the hats together, then you have to decide where to put the winter hats. It's a clever system, as the symbols and colors could be interpreted in different ways depending on the person and what other products you have. I enjoyed my time with Wilmot's Warehouse. It's a puzzle game unlike any other, one that tests a player's spatial awareness, as well as challenging them to understand their own categorization methods. If that was all I had to say, I wouldn't have titled this video the way I did. I do think Wilmot's Warehouse was a good time, but the more I played, the more I felt disappointed. It seemed to me like the designers were trying to say something about capitalism. There are many elements that take advantage of its capitalist backdrop, which initially made me very hopeful for what was to come. The interactions with your boss, CJ, are the most obvious examples of the game laying it all out without question, clearly defining your role in this company. CJ gives out motivational posters which are intentionally patronizing, and what's more, he frames it like he's rewarding you for your hard work. They end up on the wall as posters for you to look at, the final endgame one being a map showing where your warehouse is in the city. Oh boy. At one point he's on vacation, and makes you empty out the warehouse bin while he's gone. There's also the time where he gives out employee of the month to a random service coworker that, for all you know, does nothing but wait for you to bring her products from all over the warehouse. He even mentions that you too could be employee of the month one day if you keep working hard. There are more subtle and more interesting capitalist through lines, but the point of starting this section with CJ was to show that the game was very overt with its messaging at times. There's no backing out now. This video game is at the very least bringing up the hierarchical relationship between worker and boss, and somewhat depicting the struggle of being a cog in the machine. Something that becomes more apparent as you get further into the game is how overworked Wilmot is. In the beginning, the variety and quantity of products seems perfectly manageable for one person, but close to the end, it feels intentionally overwhelming. Even with Borky helping out, along with every pillar removed and every other upgrade at your disposal, you still might end up with a wall of products going from the loading dock all the way to the service desk. Even though your job gets harder and harder, you're still expected to accomplish the tasks in the same amount of time. If we think of the upgrade stars as the compensation for your labor, your earnings never increase based on the amount of work you do. All that matters in this job is whether you met your metric of delivering the correct products in the allotted time window. That being the case, we can view the delivery and stock take phases in a particularly manipulative light. You still get a timer on the delivery phase, meaning you'll have to work at an even faster pace if you want to make sure all of your new products are put away properly before your compensated shift begins. Ready or not, your coworkers will be at the window, and the clock will begin ticking away. This already got me thinking about how exploited Wilmot was, since he had to do two jobs and was only being paid for one of them, but the stock take phase is really where it became clear for me. Every quarter, a large truckload of stock is delivered. It's different from a normal delivery, as you don't get any new items for the warehouse, instead you'll receive a bulk shipment of many you already have. There isn't a timer on these sections, you can spend however long you'd like tidying up the warehouse. When I was still a naive worker bee in the beginning of the game, I tried to keep my workspace in tip-top shape, spending between 5 and 10 minutes organizing everything perfectly so that my job would be made easier for future service phases. Wilmot and I were being exploited. Juan, one of your coworkers, I imagine, paints this untimed stock take phase as a positive. They are graciously allowing you a chance to play catch-up, and of course to set yourself up for success for the future. Viewing this as a video game, it isn't a big deal, but in this world, Wilmot is working unpaid overtime. You of course can decline to do anything during these sections, but if you want to assure yourself that you aren't working without being paid for it, that only leaves you with the service phase, where you're encouraged through the pay structure to clock out as early as you can. I want to be clear, so far all of this is great. 
the exploitation and constant backbreaking work with little benefit or downtime, along with the obviously patronizing boss figure giving out motivational posters, the seemingly higher status co-workers who don't seem to care about Wilmot's well-being, it all gives this cute and wholesome puzzle game some nuance, something for the player to think about as they keep playing. However, that's really as far as the game takes it until the very end. Once your warehouse holds 200 different products, the game is over, and Wilmot is replaced by robots. He's unceremoniously terminated from employment, and a fancy end credits scene plays out. There's a lot of ways we can read this ending, but I don't want to talk about that quite yet. Between this ending of being replaced by machine labor, and getting your very first delivery could have been a lot more. I think one of the core parts of the game that held it back was the decision to go with performance stars instead of a paycheck. You could easily make the case that the stars aren't actually your compensation, they're just a tongue-in-cheek reward structure to poke fun at the demeaning ways out-of-touch companies motivate their employees. Maybe Wilmot does get paid a decent wage, and has a nice house even, and etc. It's hard to say, since canonically, Wilmot never leaves the warehouse, we never see a hint of his real life in the game. I really think this was a missed opportunity. It definitely didn't need to be anything significant, but showing that Wilmot leads a lowly life without many extravagances would have gone a long way. If the compensation was money instead of stars, it also would have gone a long way to show his paycheck every month mostly being used up on bills, with a small amount left over for the player to decide to use on whatever they like. Maybe include a few songs to purchase for when you're working in the warehouse, maybe some cheap company approved hats to wear. The game could charge the player for all of the warehouse upgrades that already exist in the game. Maybe management will only allow certain improvements and additions to the workspace if they come out of someone's paycheck. I don't know about you, but I have definitely worked at places in the real world where getting any sort of slight improvement meant it had to come out of my own pocket. Perhaps every in-game year, there's a new uniform you're forced to wear, causing the company to take the cost out of your paycheck. Having to pay for a new work uniform for your character every year, for a job that doesn't require any customer interaction, would be absolutely perfect to demonstrate the absurdity of blanket corporate policies. Maybe one of those company-approved hats you bought for yourself earlier in the game becomes unapproved after one of your coworkers complains to corporate, and you lose out on the money that you spent. There are just so many ways including a money system would have benefited the theme. It really wouldn't have taken that much work, either. I'm not proposing some Sim-style house to return to or anything. Papers, Please, Valhalla, and Not Tonight all have menu screens acting as the home section at the end of each day, and all of those games make similar attempts at creating an engaging gameplay loop around an otherwise mundane job. Papers, Please especially makes Wilmot's Warehouse look unambitious by comparison. This oppressive dictatorship is controlling every aspect of your life, and not only are you forced to do this job sufficiently enough to keep your family alive with the money you've earned, but on top of all of that, you have moral decisions to make. Should you keep your head down and follow the strict code set out for you so you can be assured you'll have enough money to eventually escape this hellhole, or do you make some mistakes on purpose, let people in who don't have their documents in order because it's the right thing to do? There's nothing even approaching that in Wilmot's Warehouse, even though the inherent inequality that capitalism dishes out provides plenty to work with. Papers, Please also does a better job at showing how worthless you are in the grand scheme of things. If you do a poor enough job, you'll either see your family die, or you'll go to prison. If you do a poor enough job in Wilmot's Warehouse, nothing changes. This is the final nail in the coffin as far as I'm concerned. You can literally do nothing in the warehouse, never give anybody the products they need, never make room for new deliveries, and not only does the game progress the same exact way with you being replaced by robots by the end of 2001, CJ keeps commending you time and time again for your hard work. The first time all of the products aren't delivered to your coworkers on schedule, he reprimands you and doesn't give out any stars that week. He says the same thing regardless of if you were busting your ass and barely missed the deadline, or if you didn't do anything. This is kind of a good thing, since him not caring about the circumstances of a missed goal and chewing you out the same way definitely sounds like a middle management power-hungry boss to me. But that's the only time he brings it up, no matter how often you fail. On my first playthrough, that was the only time I failed, so I took what he said to heart. I gave the game too much credit, and thought I might get fired and have to start all over again if I messed up enough times. This prompted me to spend even more time organizing my warehouse, succumbing to the crunch mentality that our businesses sometimes encourage, something I thought the developers were trying to convey. 
now that I know there are no consequences to failing, that you can literally stare at your coworkers as you do nothing to help the business, there's just no reason to care. This turns the performance stars and the upgrades you receive into something entirely intrinsic. I understand everyone that plays video games deep down wants to play the game for its own sake, but really the only thing encouraging you to accomplish your tasks to get these performance stars is so you can play the game with those upgrades that will make it easier to play the game for its own sake. The motivation stems from the facade that working at this warehouse is what you want to do, not something that is required of you to make ends meet. I can understand where the designers were coming from, as I also have worked in a cramped warehouse where I had to sort and stack oversized boxes into sensible locations. I've also had to get products for my other coworkers. Believe me when I say that there is a sense of satisfaction and zen-like flow state when working uninterrupted to organize everything in the warehouse. However, I also enjoy playing Papers, Please for the sake of it. That game somehow manages to have an engaging and intrinsically fun gameplay loop even though you're just skimming through documents, but what makes that game so gripping is you have to play well to keep playing the game. If you play terribly, you'll either die or get sent to prison and need to start over. If you play slightly better than that, your family will most likely starve or get sick, or you won't be able to see one of the good endings. Yes, there are quite a few ways that game can end. There's only one way Wilmot's Warehouse can end, and it is entirely unrelated to how you performed in it. Seeing the citations pile up in Papers, Please is terrifying, as you only get three before they start docking your paycheck, and every bit of money is essential. Watching the products pile up in Wilmot's Warehouse now evokes nothing in me, since CJ doesn't care, the coworkers don't care, and the game doesn't care. You're expected to care. After a while, the truck driver won't even deliver any more goods since the dock is so backed up. This means even though your warehouse has the potential to stock a massive amount of different products, you won't ever see them come in on the truck, the coworkers will never ask for something you don't have access to, yet CJ still commends you for having a larger product inventory in the warehouse. It's all so incongruent. At the very least, I would think your coworkers should be asking for those new products, it's never said if we're grabbing it for them to sell to customers or what have you, but if CJ thinks we stock them, so should they. That would have been a nice minor consequence if your dock wasn't empty enough for the new products to come in. It would have to go along with more impactful punishments for not doing a good enough job, but at least then the coworkers could feel like real humans instead of cardboard cutouts that go away when a timer elapses. Finally, the ending to the game is pretty bizarre. If we view it through the lens of corporate greed and workers' rights and all of that, at-will employment mixed with automation taking people's jobs is and was a genuine fear for certain sectors of the working class. Wilmot just lost his job, one that the designers admit he probably loves. I sure hope other places are hiring nearby, and I hope his skill set, one that's so easily replaced by machines, translates to something else so he doesn't literally starve. To an extent, this ending is actually kind of good. After all his hard work and dedication, CJ relieves Wilmot of his duty without so much as a gift basket as a thanks. That matches the theme I wanted the game to focus on, which is why it feels so out of place for what the game actually is. If working in the warehouse is meant to be fun in and of itself, having that job taken away from you, as if it's some finish line that you crossed, sends a strange message. CJ says you can finally put your feet up, which definitely implies that this is a hard job, especially if you're the only person in the warehouse. If you come back to visit on a completed save file, CJ makes it pretty clear this isn't your warehouse anymore, even asking you to turn out the lights on your way out. Wilmot is no longer welcome here. Do you see what I mean with all of this? Throughout the game, they didn't take the theme far enough to make any sort of biting social commentary, yet the ending seems to fit more on one side of the coin than the other. Some games do need to end, but the finish to Wilmot's Warehouse being an arbitrary 200 products in the inventory doesn't connect with anything significant, and it doesn't fit the nature of what the game was apparently trying to be. Is this ending trying to say that you shouldn't get too attached to the job you love because your employer can always take it away from you? Even looking at the ending through the social commentary lens once more, being replaced at the beginning of 2002 regardless of if you were a good worker or not doesn't make any sense and neuters what impact this ending could have provided. They should have kept this strictly for the players who played well and fired any players who didn't do a good enough job when it was appropriate. As it is now, if this end credit sequence truly is the finish line, 
being able to cross it without even a single successful service phase is nonsensical. All of this is to say, I don't think Wilmot's Warehouse lived up to its full potential, however my idea of the game's full potential probably doesn't align with the designers. I can completely understand them not wanting to have a darker tone like in Papers, Please, or to even broach the more serious ramifications of uncaring businesses and overworked employees. It seems like they had an idea for a novel puzzle game first and foremost, emulating that flow state feeling one of them had when working in a warehouse when they were younger. Wilmot's Warehouse probably wasn't meant to be anything more than a fun puzzle game with a unique and wholesome art style. CJ and his motivational posters, along with the performance stars and blissfully uncaring co-workers, were possibly just there to poke fun at previous work experiences. Unfortunately, all of that is what made me yearn for more. There was so much to explore with this setting that wasn't, and the pleasant art style would have only benefited the messaging. Keeping the surface appearance just as cute and wholesome would have made the decisions and outcomes that much more impactful if they had made this world less forgiving. Wilmot's Warehouse is a game I think is well worth playing, one that I'd recommend to people, but not one I'm likely to come back to in the future. I'm perfectly content with handing the warehouse keys over to the machine workforce, but I'm not necessarily sure if I should be. Thanks for watching everyone, and thanks to my supporters over on Patreon, some of whom should be on the screen right now. If you'd like to join these wonderful names, you can head over to my Patreon and join the $5 tier. Once I get 10 or so patrons, I'm planning on running a poll where you can vote on which game I cover on the channel. Exciting, I know. This was a weird departure from my usual videos, so I hope you all enjoyed it. I wanted to talk about this game for a while now, but couldn't find the right angle. Doing a full review on the game felt kind of boring to me, and this was what I settled on. Anyway, I'll conclude this video with the classic Dork Axe tagline. I hope I'll see you next time. Donkey Donkey Donkey.